a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very profound. Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this episode, Dave Emmons comes by to talk about his book, They, What They Want, which is in reference to non-human intelligences that he has had several really creepy experiences with. Also, uh, his implant story. You guys are not going to want to miss that. So all the ways to find Dave are going to be located down in the show notes. Located down there also is our affiliate links. So of course, Food Forced Abundance, guys, get your freedom from fear on. Uh, Libsyn, if you would like to start your own podcast, that link gives you two months free. If you are going to buy any damn thing at all on Amazon, feed that beast through our link. It helps the show. There's an affiliate link right on down there for you. Uh, Also, Opus, the organization for paranormal understanding and support it's a wonderful wonderful organization here to help for any of your needs definitely check the link down in the show notes also if you would like to expand your experience with us here on the show you can do so at expandingrealitypodcast.com that's going to be where links to everything go are too hot for youtube that thing just keeps growing youtube found another i guess video that we uh, posted an interview with tom barnett over a year ago and they said ah it's too hot, uh, but luckily uh, you just throw it on our website, so we do that. Um, so we have a home for that kind of stuff that's just way too cool for YouTube. Go over there, check it out, guys. Absolutely free. Also, uh, episodes come out a little bit early over there for free. We're starting to do that as well. Go check out the website. It's really, really cool. Uh, so let's get right to this amazing conversation. Dave Emmons, come on down. Ladies and gentlemen, welcoming to the show, we have Dave Emmons hanging out with us. You are so cool, man. You're a legend. Uh, You've written an awesome book, They, What They Want, and we are going to get into all of it. So my friend from my audience that's not too familiar with you, do you mind just introducing yourself for us? Sure. I'm a little bit senior than than you are, Brandon, but I've, I've been through a lot of things in my life. I've been through the military service. I've had course top secret i can explain that i got out of it because i didn't like it i didn't like military intelligence people telling me every week did you send out a mail did did you did you tell your friends or family about anything i said no the mail is opened you could see everything i send so i got it not even being 20 years of age i just decided i've had enough i had an 89 percent average in the class it was a nuclear weapons class at redstone arsenal huntsville alabama in 1969 and 19 part of 1970. so that's where i was at then it was neat to be in the class but uh, i was the only high school graduate in the class the rest of them were master's degrees and all this other so there's 15 of us in the class so i i tested very well through uh, the military testing. And so that's how I got in that elite class, but I didn't like it too young to put up with the stuff that too restricted. So I went to a post chaplain to get out of it, had to go twice and then talk to my old man. And they got me out of it, put me in another little class to give me an MOS. And then when the Vietnam popped up, my brother got orders for, cause his wife was having a baby. I said, no, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to Vietnam. So I went to Vietnam. I was platoon leader, actually playing the role of Lieutenant come back to Fort Benning, Georgia. And then I served that out for 11 months. And I was going to be commissioned for as a lieutenant and I didn't want it. I said, I don't want to go back to Vietnam. And the colonel said, how do you know you're going to go back? I said, Colonel, I know the army. (laughs) I know they don't promise you nothing really, but I got out, but that's the top secret thing. I wanted to get that out of the way because I'm questioned about that. And uh, yes, I did work in top secret for about two or three months. uh, And it took them six months to get the top secret. So I guess the army was pissed off because I got out of the class, they wasted all that money. I feel bad for that, but it's something I didn't want to go to Sandia down in underground uh, work centers and stuff. So I didn't like that either. Okay, on to uh, my rest of my life. I've been a musician 45 years. I played drums and guitar. I've been an entertainer. I've owned businesses. 
Uh, I own a nightclub, a restaurant. I've owned a, a gas station and a retail uh, store center. Also, I've been involved as an electrician in my early years. I went to school part time. I got five years of college in journalism, mass communications. I went to a specialty school for that. Didn't work in radio because there was no money. So I went to other places like the Phillips Medical Company and I worked there. But I worked with the Red Cross as a disaster manager. I was a team leader at a refinery. And I am I ended up being retired. And then I wanted to search the world. So I went out west a lot and I checked on what's out there. And I was researching this back in 2010, 2011, when I started doing a lot of research. And this is where I got a lot of the research for my book. Of course, a lot of things happened to me, even from early on. My first experience was actually when I was 13. And it was more or less a, a regressed dream. But I remember sitting out in the backyard. This was in Alton, Illinois. And this is where I saw all my UFOs. So Illinois is loaded with UFOs. You don't have to go out west to see them. So I uh, I saw this craft come over, and it looked like a small barge with bright white lights on the front of it and had a blue hazy light underneath of it. And I was only like, you know, 13, and I was sitting outside and looking up at the stars. For some reason, I always liked being alone and looking up at the stars. And, and I had uh, 10 brothers and sisters. They were all in the house watching TV, and I was just outside. But this thing came over, and then I don't remember anything after that. I remember going into the bed, and my brother and I had to share a bed because there's 11 of us in the family. I, we didn't grow up rich, that's for sure. So, uh, but I remember being numb and laying there in bed and something was standing beside me at the bed after I saw this, this UFO. So I didn't know what was really going on at the time, but I, I kind of put it together later on when I had these other experiences that kind of matched this one that they, they, I use this term dumb down, but I did that with a scientist friend of mine the other, the other day, he said, no, he said, you were, you were brightened up. You were, you know, you lifted your intelligence and your consciousness were lifted, not dumbed down. I said, I said, but yeah, doc, but I, I talked to a lot of interesting people and this is where I get a lot of my information. Uh, I put the pieces of the puzzle together and, but I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And then when this thing was gone from the side of my bed, I felt like I could move a little bit. And I woke my brother up and said, did you hear or see anything? He said, no, go to bed. And he called me a few names. Of course, brothers do that. <laughs> but, uh, but the next occurrence happened about a year later, uh, and which was very, it, it was the eye opener thing. Uh, this was a totally conscious uh, uh, event. Uh, the first one was was conscious just for a little while in the backyard, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm I'm out of it. I don't know what what happened. And there's been a lot of abductions that people say that you know that that happens to them. But this one here, my buddy and I in 1963, uh, we were setting the other one was 1962. This was in '63. It was summertime. He was out of school. We were setting down on uh, some steps at my buddy's. Uh, lower apartment. He lived there with his dad. And so we smelled this sulfur smell, some kind of a smell. We didn't know what it was. Something was burning. Uh, we looked up, we saw some lights uh, blinking through the treetops and the radio 10 transistor radio was crackling and popping. And I asked my buddy, I said, did you have, you got new batteries in there? He said, yes, I do. And I said, okay, good. And we're drinking Pepsi out of glass bottles. So that dates me. Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> well, they started making them again as a throwback for nostalgia. So yes, really? sir, it does. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. I just might have to get one. Maybe I'll get abducted again. They're, you know, they're better that way. I'm telling you. And especially after an abduction, a nice fresh Pepsi out of a, a glass bottle is the only way to go, right? It, yeah, mm -hmm. and I, you know, being abducted, you know, I want to throw something else in there too. <laughs> it, you're parched. Yeah, I mean, uh, you need to recover, uh, just like uh, Travis Walton in the Fire in the Sky. Whenever he, you know, got returned, he ran right to the water and just started drinking like crazy. I, I imagine you'd be pretty dehydrated. Right. Uh, but my buddy and I, he went up to get uh, a flashlight, and we went to his dad's truck, got the flashlight. He said he carried the radio. He didn't. And I remember things pretty, uh, my brother asked me, he said, how do you remember so many details? I told him about our friends, our old friends back in the day. He said, how do you remember that? I said, I just do. I got a good memory there. I guess there's been some inputs or something. So we stood in this empty lot after we followed it up. There was a couple of small lights on it, white lights. And there was one red one just on the, on the top of it. It looked like one of these fat. Uh, saucer shapes that you pump with a with a screw handle the old timers it looked like that a little pudgy it's in my i got it in my book and uh 
but it's it's I was looking at the portals, the windows. This thing was about 30, 35 feet wide and maybe about 20 feet tall. And it was over my backyard, actually. And we were looking at it from another lot up just above my yard in which a little slight incline. So we watched this thing for a while. And we pinched each other and we said, do you see what I'm seeing? We said, yeah, I see it. I said, don't pinch me so hard. I remember those words. And after that, we don't. He said it. He heard a little uh, buzzing, hissing sound. I didn't. I was paying more attention to the portals and the windows. We saw shadows moving around, but we did not see. I did not see an ET. I was afraid to, but I was I was wanting to see one. Uh, we didn't see one. And we stood there for a while. All of a sudden, we had we had some lost time. This started around 10, 20, 10, 30 in the evening. And it. I think when I got in the house is around midnight. And my mom was really uh, pissed off. You know, when I got in, I she had the, all the doors locked. She said, where you been? I said, well, I've been with Rawhide. Uh, that was my friend. And uh, she said, she said, uh, I told her, I said, I saw a flying saucer, mom. She said, I'll, I'll fly and saucer your butt to get in the house. And and later on, I found out that the reason why she was very uh, hard about that flying saucer stuff, because her family has seen them in the past and she's had past episodes of ET stuff. Your mom. Yes. Yes. And that's why, uh, excuse the allergies. I, oh, I'm you're just, fine, dude. We're, <laughs> we're going, uh, Texas is doing it as well. It's beautiful, but yeah, it kind of comes. Yes. Up. Yes. Um, it's, uh, you know, all these flowering buds and everything, but, uh, also it seems like when you get abducted and you're around ET, your nose runs also like water. Yeah, that'll, that'll happen. And a while ago, you mentioned uh, being thirsty and dry after an episode that happens too. You're, you're correctly 100% right. That happens. But as we went into the house, he went to his dad and he's told his dad, I saw a flying saucer, dad. He said, son, go to bed. Okay. You saw a flying saucer. So that was it for that. And of course, back in those days, we told our friends, they just laughed at us. Uh, they don't laugh as much anymore, but they're still kind of, you know, they'll take a little sharp knife and kind of jab you in the back a little bit. Uh, and one of our own worst enemies are the fellow ufologists. Hmm. This is that we're, we're turning on each other. Well, it's kind of like the talking heads are now the gatekeepers. If if they like you or if they think they can make a story out of what you got, then they'll do it. But if 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 you don't come on, like if you have one big experience and you can explain it uh, and then it, they, they want pictures also, but you can't get pictures around UFOs. This is something I've been telling these people. You don't think of a camera when you're dumbed down. You don't think of a camera, even if you got one on you, you don't use it because they tell you tell, telepathically don't pick up a ball bat, don't get a weapon, just watch and observe. And that's it. Let us handle things. We're in control. So after that, uh, my buddy and I talked about that, uh, that sighting for some time afterwards, and we still do to this day. But I, I see he's having little memory lapses. We're getting a little older, but he's got these little memory lapses. And I uh, just the last couple of years, we talked about the story, but now he, he says little things differently. And uh, maybe his memory lapses and he sees things differently than I do. But I've been involved with these things for some time. So I, I think I have a uh, some kind of an implant or something in me that, that makes me remember certain things and regress certain things. And my buddy doesn't, he doesn't, he hasn't had a, a UFO encounter ever since that. And, and I've had many. And I told him about that. And I, I saw, actually saw this thing fly away. He didn't see it fly away. It actually changed degrees and angles. We looked at it from the Southwest. I got into a little scientific thing about it, went up and drew the, the whole thing out up in this lot. And we was looking at it in the Southwest. It moved to the West and must have been steady about 30, 40 degrees West of the South, uh, Southwest. And so it moved and we didn't see it move. Okay. We just saw it setting still and so about 70 feet up. So it flew off real quick in the clouds. My buddy didn't see it fly off. So I come out of the dumb down the star that they, they shoot you with this magnetic energy. And that's what I call dumb down. They take and control your mind. And they do that. They do that all the time when, when you're close to them. Or even if you're close to a ship, there's a doctor, uh, Gary, I think, what's his name? Uh, Landon, something like that. And I wrote him, been wanting to talk to him. He knows all about abductions. He teaches at, at Stanford University. And he, he has all this equipment. He can, he can actually take a CAT scan of people who's been abducted, or he says, even close to a UFO. If you've had a close sighting, he said the left part of your brain enlarges. 
and that's the perception you perceive things from that that left side and this is what they communicate with and to this this left side of the brain and his his work is amazing i should have his name out uh but people all uh maybe look it up a little later but i think is you know it's uh it's gary Hanson or the uh, Nolan. Nolan. That's it. Okay. I'm an old timer. All right. You it's, got it's it though. Gary. That's perfect. Yeah. Gary look Nolan. Absolutely. Gary, look up Gary Nolan. He's got YouTube. He's got research. Phenomenal. He knows this stuff down. And when he's talked about the abduction, I said, Wow, wow. I kept hitting my chest that he's right on. He's telling it like it is. And and it's true. But uh, I want people to maybe take a look at, at Gary Nolan's work and check him out, Stanford University. And if they want to know about abduction, I've been trying to get through to him. I want to talk to him. Uh, I want to find out some th other things about what's going on. But uh, there was two weeks after that, I told my buddy, I said, look, we had some lost time. He said, well, yeah, I don't really know. He says, yeah, it was late. And my mom said it was really late. She can't re really remember. Uh, but uh, two weeks later, I had I had a an implant put. Uh, they put an implant. This is where the other other shoe drops in journalism. That's what we call it. They say you get you start a, a you start a story, you get these following facts, and then you put it together like a puzzle. I said, okay, this second shoe dropped. I was my left testicle. It, I felt a lump in there, and I said I was fourteen. And I and I felt it and I said, what's going on here? And then I looked down and there was a red line about an inch long and it was like a laser line. Now that I, I know what's what laser cuts look like, it was a laser cut, very thin. I was able to push it out after about two or three minutes of struggling. I got it out of that hole where it was cut. And I said, well, that's what that thing was cut and put in there. And I showed it to my mom and she goes, that's just an ingrown hair. She said, throw it away. I said, no, mom. I said there was a, there was a, a cut line that I took it out of. I said it was already cut. It put in there. I took it out through the same cut line, and she looks at me weird. She didn't know what to say, and then but she still said throw it away because she was afraid. And what I found out later, she was afraid of flying saucers. She told us kids do not approach a flying saucer. Back in the fifties and sixties, they used to tell people don't approach craft that you don't know anything about, especially flying saucers. There was a big scare back then. But instead of walking away from it, my buddy went to it. So, you know, uh, my mom was protecting me at that point because her family has seen a couple of UFOs in their backyard. And my mom later on has had experiences in her house with uh, dark, tall, slender things coming into her room and actually molesting her. My, my part, other family members, they tell me, how come she talks to you about that? She's 94. And she still talks about that stuff. And she's still interested in what I'm doing because she says, keep doing it. She said, don't forget to put in your book that you were born with long gray sideburns. I said, mom, what does that mean? She goes, she said, that means you're special. She said, there's, there's something that, that you're going to be, you know, something's going to happen that's special to you. And nothing really special to me. I haven't except for the ETs, the ET visitations. And we can get into the, uh, uh, ETs going into bodies and then growing up as they're with us now. And they're, they're all over. People don't understand this. Dr. Dr. David Jacobs wasn't wrong. They do walk with us. I've seen a lot of strange people. Some of them will approach you and they just look at you and you feel like you're kind of, you're dumbed down magnetic energy, but they're there. There's a lot of them out there, but going back to the story, I know I'm jumping back and forth, but I want to get some of these parts in. Uh, after that, uh, there was a lull. I don't know. In the in Vietnam, they asked me, "Did I see anything in Vietnam?" No, I didn't. I uh, didn't see anything because I was so tired. You'd only get two, three hours of sleep. Combat wears you down, and so if something was playing with my mind, I wouldn't have known it because there's other things playing with my mind. You know, keeping alive and keeping my 42 guys alive in my platoon. So that was that was the main purpose of that, but. In the 70s, I, I went to school. I, I was going school part time, working six days a week, playing music three nights a week until I passed out at the mirror in the morning. And the doctor told me I had to slow down. So I think I was so busy during those years that even if I would have had a visitation, I wouldn't have known it. 
and and believe me there's been some some times that i i felt i probably what was visited but i i don't know 50 percent of people that's been abducted don't know they've been abducted and that's with with the, the scientists say uh Bernie mac uh, dr jacobs all these people agree that 50 percent of the people don't know it they wake up in the morning they scratch their heads oh well that was a weird dream or that was a weird happening but actually they were abducted uh, Let me ask you something there, though, because uh, I agree with you. So why do you think some people are allowed to remember? Because of their consciousness. Uh, one of the things that's very important to the ETs is our level of consciousness, awareness of what's around us. The, the part that you're asking me about, it's only bits and pieces. Now, I've got several regressed dreams that were very full from beginning to end. And so the time uh, might have been faster than what I thought, but there are bits and pieces that come to me afterwards. It takes it sometimes two, three years, and then all of a sudden it comes in. It's, it's a weird thing. It's, you get into a deep sleep, and then you have this regression. And if your consciousness is high, and they, they said that's why I was talking to this other doctor, in which I, I can't mention his name because there's a lot of stuff that we're talking about and uh i you know i, I can't I'm not putting that out with anything yet I, there's other scientists that I, I i work with and uh i've gotten some material and i can't put that out about the hum towels hum i have that too uh but it's it's kind of like uh you you they they pick you for certain reasons it could be dna it, it, there's I, because they say that 80 percent of our dna is uh, is waste and that's what scientists say but now they're saying no they figured out that maybe only 50 percent of its waste and they found out the other 30 percent is is something that was put into us for fighting viruses and diseases and things of that nature some of these this dna comes comes up ahead when when things attack you like the like take the coronavirus and that's why some people with t-cells uh can get away from the the virus and that's the reason why is because they have the dna that's 50 percent wasted in their body that it comes forward and says okay now it's time for us to fight but a big theory in which i've been talking about it, it could be in my next book the the big theory i think we're carrying around not only our own soul but we're carrying around somebody else it's that's living living through us uh and this is what the ets do when you're born actually they go into that body uh, an et will t go into that body and take it over some people are hybrids and they don't know it and and some people are real hybrids and they're contacted and they do know it but they cannot talk about it i have people talking to me that just about tell me that you know okay they are but they cannot teach us anything technical they can't give away who they are or how intelligent they are they're living as humans and they can actually be a, a masseuse a piano player and and they exist in that fashion they're watchers uh, some people might call them angels well i've ran into angels in my time too that saved my butt but uh and i'll be talking about that in, in my next book too but i I see these these things as following certain people. They they talked about Indian, uh, American Indian, Native Indian DNA. They follow. Well, my family, my mom's side has Crow Indian, and uh, she's almost about fifty percent Crow, and I'm I'm probably down to twelve percent by the time it it levels out. But that was a theory. But I don't know if that theory is still holding. I, I heard that theory several years ago. But if that's true, then that's part of why they attract. They say, why are they attract to you and not to me? And then I got family members who's actually seen UFOs. And my brothers have seen strange things in their house and things happen. My sister is a psychic. She has the psychic abilities. And she, she tells me about dreams that she has that pertain to me. And uh, they're kind of weird, but they hit right on. So it's, and my mom's the same way. She can sit in a room and she can sit at the table. And if, if I come in and if I have a little problem that's bothering me, she'll look at me. She said, she said, what's your problem? And I'm happy and I'm, I'm actually drinking a beer and I'm happy. And she'll say, what's your problem? I said, what do you mean, mom? And I know she's reading me. She's really good at that. She can go into a room and read the room. So she's got those abilities. And that's why she's been 
you know, had ET visitations in her house. She said they have put her hand, their hands on her and things of that nature. And this has been throughout her life that this has happened. She said she's seen some weird things. So it does travel in the family. They will follow the family. What they're doing is they ask, OK, what what do they want from us? What they're wanting is they check our DNA. There's three forms of abduction for people to uh, understand. First form is bedside. I had a bedside abduction back in 95 when I saw this little gray alien about three and a half feet tall. He didn't look like the Hollywood gray, real smooth and little cute little guys didn't look like that. He was wrinkled. I mean, very deep wrinkles. He didn't have the black lenses on. I could see the whites of his eyes, but I couldn't tell the color, his iris or anything. But he, his eyes were about twice our size. And and he was just standing there. And how this happened is I was awake. I was conscious. I I thought my uh, daughter walked in through our master bedroom to go in our master bathroom to get aspirins. She had headaches. And I thought it was her. And I hollered out her name three times. And I had my my chin cupped in my right hand. And I and I said, said her name and she wouldn't answer. I saw this dark figure walk past the mirror, come to my bedside. And I leaned on my left hand, put my chin in my left palm. And here pops this this three and a half foot, ugly, wrinkled, little gray, green guy looking right at me. And I was sitting there and I said, oh, my God. You know, I was scared for about five, six seconds. All of a sudden I was out. He just knocked me out. And I'm sure what he what he did is he took a, a brain scan. They have these scanners that can read your mind. They can tell what you've been learning, what you've been doing. And, and they had they can put that on all in a recorder. They check for that's the frequencies they get. They have a, a me, little machine, a monitor that can do that. Second, they, they take little scrapes of your skin for DNA testing. And then they take semen and then they take eggs from women. But more than likely, women will be taken to the ship. That's the second form of abduction. They will take like women. It's, it's more of a uh, it's, it's not as easy uh, for a woman. They have to go in in a surgical maneuver and, and put a, something in the in the in the stomach area and they, they pull out eggs. Well, that's a little bit more dramatic than what us men go through. So the women more than likely might be taken on the ship if they're looking for eggs for hybridization. Hybridization is one of the big one of their big things that they want to do. And that's why they're here. And they're here. Some of them are here. There's four of them here on earth, four types. Those types are here to oversee us, kind of protect us, but also they're, they're manipulating our intelligence and our, and our minds. They're doing that too. For some goal, they have a goal and plan. Hybridization might be the takeover goal of everything. I got two hybrid uh, kids. Asian, Japanese, I know that that came to my door in 2011. So I know that, and this is where the result three times, I remember having a little tube going to my groin area and I kicked it away. Uh, Twice I kicked it away because I woke up when they they started doing it. And then, uh, then they put me back down to sleep. I mean, they, they hit me with this magnetic energy and, and put my mind at rest. So that has happened to me several times, but to go back to this implant that was in my testicle, I found that kind of weird, even at 14. And that just started. And my buddy, he didn't realize no, no implant or anything. I had a regress dream on that one too. And this, you asked me, how do you, how do you get this? I don't really know, but it goes into a deep sleep and it may take several years sometimes for you to have the, the regress dream. I had a regress dream about that, that sighting that my buddy and I saw in, in 63, I was on a a metal table. It was dark, kind of really warm in the room. It was dark. I felt the presence of my friend being near to me somewhere, but I couldn't see him. I was really groggy. I mean, like like coming out of anesthetic. And I was really groggy. And I was trying to put on a shirt that was too small. And I was a little bit more chubbier than my friend. So his shirt was small. Mine was medium or whatever. But I couldn't put a shirt on. But eventually I got the right shirt on, apparently, because we both showed up in the lot, you know, after we don't know, an hour, hour or so. We both showed back up in the lot standing right where we, where, where we were le- uh, left. And uh, so that I told my friend that, but he hasn't had no regress dreams of that. And there could be a difference between his DNA and mine in which they were more, you know, they wanted to do more research on or, or they wanted to, uh, I guess, 
uh, keep a check on me. These are watchers, like they talk in the Old Testament and in Jesus' time. These are same thing. They're ET. They're watchers. They're watching us. Uh, they're they. Some people call them angels. I can call them angels at times because if they do good things, they can intervene into our lives anytime they want to. They can control our minds. Uh, but they ask, why do they want to do this? Well, one of the things, like I said, hybrid. And also, you have to realize that there's millions of life forms out there. We're not the only humans in the universe. We, there's other humans. And what they're doing is they're... I was on this on this ship on a regress dream on on one of these UFO things. I, I'll go through the UFOs real quick, then I'll go into that. The the other uh, uh, the next UFO I saw after '95, I saw that little gray guy, and I, I woke up and I was my eyes were twitching. I went in the bedroom, asked my wife, which is ex wife now. I asked her, I said, "Did you hear or see anything?" She goes, "No, go to bed." I couldn't. My eyes were just twitching. I mean, a nervous tick, and so I watched. My face was cold water and I was about ready to go to work in about an hour or so anyway. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to stay up because I was just really nervous. I mean, it just bothered me so much. And and when that happens, see, that's the first alien that I've seen. I didn't see one in 63. They had us knocked out and it was dark. So, but this one I saw. And so I said, oh no, this is going to continue on. And uh, it, it was weird. And it did in 2001, uh, I believe and I have it marked down 2001. I saw this. Uh, it looked like a uh, it, it just it looked like a little plane or some kind of a drone, as we would call it today, and had no cockpit, no method of, of energy. It had wings. They're about 15 feet long. The fuselage was about 15, 20 feet long. And it just had one vertical tail. It didn't have the horizontal uh, tail on the back, just the vertical. And it was real quiet, didn't make a sound. It was just floating real slow. And, it, and I was up on a, on a 14th deck of a tower inspecting the, the walls of the tower from the heat and everything for the, our generator. So I looked at this thing and it, it moved to the south. And I thought, wait a minute, they're not allowed to be over a, a refinery. It's against the law. Only EPA uh, planes and government officials with a license or permit to go over refinery can go over a refinery. No regular plane can do that. And I thought, well, they didn't care about the law, so they must not have been from here. So I told the guys in the control room, I said, hey, I saw the UFO. And they said, oh, Dave, you're crazy. There goes that crazy stuff again. But the next night, they, they put a dream uh, in my head, a very lucid dream, and they planted it. Uh, they can do that very easily, but they were telling me what time was going to going to what's going to happen in the next four or five months. They, I went, I was walking through the unit. It was all quiet. I was, you know, it's pretty loud in a in a cat cracker refinery unit making gasoline, and it's it was all quiet. I was checking the machinery and checking everything, and I said, "Why is it so quiet? What's going on?" And if the unit goes down, that's a scary thing because you got to control coming down because you can blow up the city. So I ran in the control room. It was dark. No lights were on. Nobody was in there. And then something hit me telepathically. It didn't talk to me. It said the plant will be closed in just a few months. And this is what you're seeing, a closed plant. So I told the guys the next day and they said, oh, you're crazy. They just put in $5 million for repairs in this unit. I said, yeah, I know. Maybe they're trying to sell it, but because but we're not going to be here in a few months. So you're crazy. So I had to go for a back surgery. So I was out of it for a couple of months. But during that time, they shut the plant down and it was closed. And it was it was something that I saw ahead of time and which they gifted me. You ask about how do they how do you remember these things? Well, they gift you sometimes with some memory and they give you a tidbit. Of, of the future. And I, I got that also several times I've had those dreams, but I want to continue on this, this, uh, this glider looking thing was all metal. It looked like it was like it was uh, liquid. It, it just shined so much. And it was just weird. I knew it was a UFO. Uh, and because I just felt the, the vibrations, I knew something was telling me something. And then what they were doing is putting downloading a dream and they're going to let me know, okay, you did see something special. We're going to give you a little gift. 
we're going to give you a gift of, of a dream that'll tell you the time what's going to happen. So that's what happened there. Uh, the other sighting I had, uh, I was, it was actually a disc shape. I was going up to uh, Springfield, Illinois to meet some people. There's a band there, really good. The drummer was a great drummer, and and the Janet was a great singer. So they had a good band. I went to Springfield. It was about an hour and a half away. This That's a long story, but coming, I can go into that. It was a weird uh, synchronicity, and I was actually told to go there. I didn't feel like going there. I was told to go there. And when you're told as something tells you to do something, they're wanting you to do something so they can be involved with you. Uh, when I was coming back, I saw this flying saucer come over me. There was other vehicles on I-55 heading south. Uh, this was back in 2011 also, early part of 2011. And this, I was watching, it was light, a bright light on the side of the road coming. It was going north and I was heading south. And I thought, what is that? You know, so I slowed down, take a look. And actually, when it got up on me, it went right over my car. I looked out my window, I was going about 40, uh, slowed way down, you know, because people behind me was wondering what the heck going on with this guy. But I slowed it way down, looked out the window, it crossed right over me. It was it was a round disc shape object. It had pie cuts, lights at the bottom, looked like a glass bottom in a way, and it was lit and it had a dark center to it. And I, I thought to myself, what does this mean? Why did they cross over my car when these other vehicles were there? They were telling me something. They were saying, okay, we're still watching you. We're still got our eye on you. And they still are. I mean, even today. Uh, but I got home about 40 minutes faster than what I was supposed to. The trip takes about an hour. Actually, from downtown Springfield, takes about an hour and 40 something minutes to get from there to my house. But I got home. I got home at the. Oh, I, I can't think of the time I got it written. It's 1230. I got home. I didn't think I was going to get home until about 115. I drove up in the drive in my driveway and I looked at my watch and I said, you got to be kidding me. Time just sped up. I mean, I was just zoom 40 minutes or so just zoom. So I felt uh, that shift in timing and I felt it in the car. Actually, I, I felt really funny about it. And I actually spilled my my uh, soda, I think, that I got from McDonald's on the way out. And, and I, I spilled it and I said, that's I was just shaky from the event. And uh, so I said, this is weird. Uh, now, the, the next the next uh, craft I saw it. Now, this was in 2011 when I saw this in 2010, 2011, in that period, 09, 2010, 2011. I, that's this high activity very high activity. Two years ago, I had high activity in the house. Uh, so I'll get to that real, real soon here. But the other one I saw was, was a huge triangle craft that come over my neighborhood. April 9th is about 830 in the evening. It was just getting dark and it was cloudy. And it come over my house. It was huge. It covered nine houses on our block. It, we had a dead end block. We I lived on, and my family, two of my family members lived. My mom lived right down the road from me. And I, after this craft come over me, there's a picture in my book that this thing was huge, and it made a hissing, buzzing sound. I heard it come from the center, looked like the center of the ship, and which looked like a grate, like a barbecue grill, like type type of thing. I think it was an exhaust system, but that would turn red if they were in high speed. Well, they were in low speed. They were only going about 35 miles an hour right over me. I mean, the center of the ship was right over me. And I took it that they were sending me a message that this was for me to know. Uh, I think this, this also told me that uh, that Hiroko, the one that I, I saw in Sedona, that experience, she was had something to do with that ship crossing over me, probably uh, uh, saluting me, saying goodbye. So I called my mom and I said, did you guys, my two brothers were there at my mom's house. I said, did you guys see it? My mom said, see it. She goes, my God, she said, it scared me to death. She said, I wouldn't go out on the porch. And here's the word that she used. And I couldn't believe that she would say this. She said, I was afraid of being abducted. I said, really? She goes, yeah. And I said, you've had experiences. She's, she said, Dave, I told you I have. And that scared me. She said, I didn't want to go. And uh, she was 84 at the time. I think uh, she's 94 now. But my two brothers saw it too. And, and they said, my God, it was huge. 
And my mom said it killed her plants. And the top of a tree right across my my road, it died at the top and where it was close. It actually scraped the top of the tree coming over uh, over me. And then it went to the south and it just zoomed. It was gone. So it was it happened pretty fast. But it was a huge ship. I mean, that was the biggest, you know, I've seen. So, you know, it, it's uh, it's kind of like it's shock and awe when you see these things. But I've seen them before, but I still don't get over the the awesomeness of what I'm seeing each time that it happens to me. Uh, during that time, I was getting uh, little A-ports. Apports, what they call them. I had them in my pocket. They, they would show up on the floor in front of me. They're little plastic disc. I got them right sitting right beside me in a little plastic container. And they're they're special to me because the way these apports showed up was that the first one was in 2012. This was right before I got married. And it was right down. I was at the commode and I looked down and on the floor was this dark gray a uh, little plastic thing, five eighths of an inch wide and about 16th of an inch thick and looked like little game chips, but I researched it and I couldn't find out game chips. What the heck, you know, it didn't look like it was smaller. So I said, Oh, that's curious. Maybe it come out of some clothing or something, but I never could find another one. I put it on my dresser where I put my jewelry and stuff watches. I put it there and I said, okay. Uh, and then I got married. And then soon after that, I was changing clothes in the bedroom. I looked down at the floor on the carpet was another one of those discs. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, it, it puts them right in front of me where I can see them, and which is a very unusual. Uh, so I picked it up and I, I said, there's something going on. And then right away, I related it to E.T. They're letting me know they're still there. They're, they're around me. They're watching me. So. We went to Alaska. My wife had a had a position there as a consultant, and we went there for a couple of years. Uh, it was a big experience. I didn't see any UFOs there, in which Alaska is supposed to be loaded with uh, the you know the the Alaskan Triangle and everything. But I didn't see anything there. Uh, but I, I've had some energy in the house. I actually got a a trail cam in which I started using there in the house. I lived downstairs. I lived upstairs, and there's a professor and his family who own the house and we leased it. We was just going to be there for a while. So we leased it. Uh, and that was costly, <laughs> but uh, it was, it was a pretty nice house. And, and I got, I got close to the professor. He was uh, kind of like an aquatic science uh, guy and he went to the North pole and the Fairbanks university or university of Alaska, they're in cahoots with the military. They do a lot of secret stuff. So he's with a team of scientists in which do secret stuff. Well, he took me to a rotary meeting with all the professors and everything. So I went there with him and had lunch and they talked about the college. There was a guy sitting there kind of heavy set. He had dark. They were not dark. I'd say dark blue because they were just piercing. He looked at me and I went to the bathroom. I come back, sat down and then the, the, the conversation was over. So we, we all left and I met a couple other professors there, but went home I changed pants because I was in business casual to go to the meeting and I changed into Alaskan clothes. So as I took my, uh, uh, my stuff out of my pockets, I reached in something stuck to my finger and I thought, what the heck is that? I pulled it out and there's another disc. This was another disc. And I said, Oh my God, I sat on a bed. I even called my wife at her work and I said, you won't believe this. I said, I just got a disc, put it in my pocket. This was in my pocket from the meeting. Whoever did it was around the scientists and their top secret guys, I guess, and everything. But they put this disc in my pocket. And I, I couldn't believe it. Well, it was just about two months before we left. We were there two years, about two months before we left. There was another disc. This one was red. And the reason why it was red, so you can see it in the snowpack. There's snowpack in, in the Fairbanks that you drive on for about six months. And it's actually like a coarse sandy snow so you can actually drive on it so uh before we got to the the car it was right in my walkway where i walked to the car and my wife looked down she said honey is that that, that looks like one of those discs and she picked it up and she said isn't that one of those discs that you got and i said yes it was a red one this time and i said it's the same i saw i put them all together same size different colors there's dark gray there was tan eggshell uh, color and then there was a, a copper color and then there was a red one. And these things, I 
I, I cherish and I showed them to nuns, you know, when my brother was having problems with the uh, brain cancer at the time. And she looked at those and she looked at me, she said, you're blessed. She said, you found them in different places. I said, yeah, even in Alaska. So she looked at it as a spiritual blessing. I looked at it as an ET watching me and saying, okay, we still, we still got your back. We still got your six, whatever. So the A-Forts kept coming, you know, so, uh, but the biggest story in which I'm talking to a documentarist, uh, we've become buddies and uh, we might do this story. Uh, this was in Sedona in 2010. And how this all shaped up is I went to a, a spiritualist in Springfield, Illinois. And my buddy, uh, Larry, he, he writes ghost books and everything. I had him on my show a couple of times. Great guy. And I'll probably do a, a, a book signing up in Springfield with this group of people that I usually went to meetings with. But this gal, she was she was a little bit older than me, but she was uh, an Indian guide. She had she had a lot of Indian uh, American Native Indian paraphernalia. When I drove into a lot, the lot kind of sure house set back a ways from a couple of ponds and stuff. When I drove through the lot, 200 dragonflies come over my car. I thought to myself, I've never seen this before. This is weird. And I thought this means something. It did mean something. When I drove up, I walked in and I and she said, uh, you're here for your uh, session. I said, yes, I am. She said, my name's Cheryl. And I told her my name and she says, sit down. And then she says, I'll tell you what's what's going on. I said, okay. She said, you got a bad back. I said, okay, I'll give that to you. When I walked in the door, I probably, I probably, you know, a little slumped in the shoulders and she looked at me kind of angry and then she closed her eyes. And then she said, she said, you're going on a trip. I said, yeah, in nine days. And she goes, you're going out West. I said, yeah. How'd you know? She says, guides and she pointed up and then she closed her eyes again and then she said you're going to your car is going to be damaged on this trip but she said you'll be able to drive and see your friends in new mexico i said really how bad will it be damaged she said you'll be able to drive it it'll be okay and i said okay and then then the other thing she told me which was really phenomenal was she said you're going to meet your first et and i said well it's not my first she said well you're going to meet one straight up this was, she said, you're going to meet it. And, and when did you say you was taking a trip? She said, she said, it'll be October 4th. You'll meet this, this ET. It was October 4th, about 6 30 PM in Sedona. And amazing. This woman was amazing. She could have really done some things in her life. And, and some other people who know her around the community and, and from these UFO groups, she's really, she was the only, I don't go for psychics a lot of time, but she, I asked her, said, you're not a psychic, are you? She was mad. She could no, I'm not a psychic. She got mad. And so she, what she said all turned out, I got hail damage coming out of Sedona. My car got about $2,300, $2,400 worth of hail damage. And I said, that's what she's talking about. But I was able to drive the car and I went to see my friends. And then I ran into Kuroko. This is a big story in the book. It takes up about seven or eight pages. So it's a, it's a big story and one that I'll never forget. And actually one that really showed me they exist. Humanoid ETs exist. And I'm finding out more and more now and uh, that they are amongst us. They do exist and they can't tell us anything. And sometimes they don't know, but most of the time they do because they can't impart any technical knowledge to us or when they pass in the, in the body that they're in, they might be reincarnated into a dog from what I heard. This is, this is their punishment. If they do violate, you know, the, the rules, the cosmic rule of, of uh, technology. Uh, so they're here to observe work with us and, and find, you know, just find out how everything's moving. But I drove up to cathedral rock after this, this shop jewelry shop told me they saw a UFO there. So I drove up to cathedral rock, started filming in pulls a white car in behind me. Out pops this Japanese gal, looked like she's in her early 30s, and about five foot four, five foot five, somewhere in there. Uh, she just had a real light sweater, white sweater, and a tank top, and blue jeans on. And they were mud smeared at the at the bottom, a big splash mud. And I asked her, I says, are you here waiting for somebody for a hike? She goes, no. She said, are you waiting for a group? She goes, no. She said, I'm here to see you. I said, what? She said, yeah, we're supposed to meet. 
I said, I don't know you. Do you know me? She goes, yes. I said, oh, okay. Yeah. So this was all what? weird. Uh, yeah. I got her. I got her on actually video a little bit when I asked her about UFOs and I, you know, she moved around a little bit and I, I got her on that video and I, I stopped it, but it was starting to rain. Like I told her it was going to be and it's cool. And she didn't have on much clothes. She didn't have on any jewelry, no makeup, no cell phone. Her pants were muddy from the night before. And, and she didn't have no purse, nothing. And I thought that's strange for a young woman to be walking around without those things. And uh, so we got, I said, you, you don't, you want to sit in the car and talk? So we did. We sat there and talked and to make a short. There was a guy that looked like an NSA guy with a headset on Prolo's uh, cropped hair, pulled up in a car, just a, a parking space over from me. And he did that three times within an hour and a half. We were there and he did not look at me. Not once did he look at me. And I threw, I knew this was weird. I had a license to carry a gun. I still do. Got a couple of licenses, and I had a weapon in the console. I looked at the console, started reaching for it. She looked at me with piercing eyes, and I said, "Wow!" You know, she just kind of powered me, overpowered me, and said, "Stay calm. Everything's fine." I asked asked her, "Do you know this guy?" And she just kind of shook her head. But I knew she knew that they were following her and is following what who, what I was involved with. Uh, so yeah, afterwards they tracked the NSA was it was in my computer a couple of times. So I know they was wondering what she told me, but she didn't really tell me much at all. She she did not tell me anything. I asked her. I said, "Are you an angel?" She said, "No, I'm not an angel." And I said, "What are you in your 30s?" And she looked at me with the piercing eyes, and I said, "Oh my God, here we go again." I said, "Stop it, Hiroko. You're you're hurting my eyes." I said, it, it, "I said you got power. There's something with you or about you." I told her she knew I was kind of on to her. But she then she said that she she kind of yelled at me like she said, there is no time. There is no age. Why do you worry about age and time? I looked at her and I said, oh, OK, I won't ask you again, you know. And uh, so the red flags were just popping. I mean, it was just something else. And she she related the story about her mom and dad treating her mean. And she kind of cried. It was a fake cry. She was practicing. And uh, I think you'll uh, uh, you know, I've talked to other ufologists about this and they said that she was probably new in the game of being a shapeshifter and in a humanoid form and i touched her hand her hand was burning hot i mean really hot and it was cold outside you would think she would be kind of a little chilly but i had the heater on but she was her hand was so burning hot i lifted it off and i said do you know you're burning up hot and she looked at me she goes i said are you okay she goes and she shook her head yeah and I said, wow, there was one instance that I remember, and I didn't remember it until a little bit, a little bit after the encounter. And I didn't want to remember it, I guess, but because I saw her in a different form. I looked at this guy that pulled up for the third time. She shrank down in the seat like a, like a small gray. Her eyes got bigger and she shrank down in the seat. And I looked at her. I was kind of like in a a dumbed down state the energy was strong and i was it was like okay i was in a i looked at my car you know and looked outside and i said what's going on here then i looked back at her and then she was back to original size and i did this just happen i said wow this is weird so the next day i told her i said how about if uh, i meet you for you know breakfast in the morning and i said we can talk and she goes sure and i said why is it they were supposed to meet? She said, because I was supposed to meet you. And then she kept saying she needed the baby. She had to have a baby. And I said, you have a boyfriend? You're going to get married? She goes, no, he's mean to me. And I said, oh, okay, well, how, how else are you going to have a baby? You got to have a mate, you know, and you got to have a boyfriend. I said, get married and have a baby. Go on with your life. It, this wasn't a romantic interlude with with her and I. I just didn't see it that way. I didn't. I wasn't for a lot of. I had one one uh, host in which he said this was romantic, wasn't it, Dave? I said no, it wasn't. No, no, it wasn't. It was kind of like father daughter, and that's what I kind of found out that she might have been my daughter. And uh, the next day we met at the restaurant. She was a little late, but I was sent a message in my head that she was coming. I said, okay, she's coming, but she's about 15 minutes late. So she finally showed up and I asked her, I said, did you check out of your room? You use a credit card? She didn't know what I was talking about. And I said, well, you need to call them and check out because they'll charge the next day, you know, on your credit card if you don't check out. And uh, 
she so she got the the room or the lodge place, and I don't know where she had it, got it from, but I I, I give her the phone to use, and I told her how to dial it, and I dial it up, and then she asked him. They said, "No, you're you're okay," and uh, so she handed me the phone back, and I said, uh, "You don't know anything about credit card or anything. How are you traveling?" no money, no purse, no nothing. I said, wow, that's, and then she said she ate bread and rolls at the, at the lodge that, that she stayed in. She didn't eat regular food. Now I heard that a lot of times the ETs or even hybrids will only eat, eat baked goods, donuts, this type of thing. They'll eat that not much sugar, but they, but when we want the breakfast there, there's about 12 people standing waiting in the, in the, the little gift shop connected to the restaurant. She looks around, she goes, all these people. And I looked at her and I thought, she's from Tokyo. I said, you got a thousand people in the same space that we're standing in, you know, in Tokyo. And I said, another flag popped up, you know, like, wow, she's not used to this many people. Uh, then we went and sat down. She ate a little bit, ordered for her. She didn't know what to order. So I ordered for her and she didn't eat very little. And of course, after we got done, she went to the bathroom. I don't know if she regurgitating what she ate because she doesn't eat that kind of stuff. She might just drink that blue fluid from what I saw and what I heard from other abductees said that they drink this fluid. That's what they live on, not not a solid food like we do. So we went and looked at a couple of buttes and uh, we drove around. We went to a restaurant before she had to go, said she had to go to Phoenix by three o'clock. And so I said, OK, we'll we'll get you you know, get you back before that. And we had a couple of slices of pizza and we were talking and she looked at me and she smiled. She says, I like you. I said, I like you too, Hiroko. I said, but what is this all about? She said, well, like I told you, we were supposed to meet. I said, wow. And I said, well, I said, go home, have your baby and everything will be fine. And then I took nine pictures of her. I got one picture in the book. Uh, I got nine other pictures. She repeated to me that she wanted those pictures. I said, where do I send them to uh, Neptune or something? <laughs> and she, she gave me a, an email uh, address. I give her a card and somebody asked me, says, was your address on there? I said, no, I put my name, my email address and my phone number, more of a business contact type of card. No, no, no a residence or anything. So that's what I give her. I said, well, I'll be sending you on your email. I'll be sending you the pictures. I, I dribbled them to her two at a time. And I kept asking her questions, tried to make her break and tell me who she really was. Well, my last email, I sent the last pictures and I told her, I said, Heroku, I know who you are. I said, you're a, you're an ET, a humanoid ET. And I said, there's no way, you know, that you, that you could tell me any different. I said, I, but she had handlers. They, she sent me back three or four e, uh, emails, and they were all from different people, different writing. Uh, I can tell by the different writing that they were there. She had handlers that she couldn't, she could speak English, but she could not read English. And that's why I know that she had handlers sending me uh, back the emails. So that was, I, I went home, I took notes. Uh, and then six months later, April, no, it was March 17th. 2011, six months later, she come to my house. My cousin and I was sitting on the front porch, smoking cigars. It was a nice day, St. Patrick's Day. It was about 75 degrees, really nice in Illinois for that time. And I, I said, wow, this is a nice day. And all of a sudden, there's some Asians that showed up down the road from me. And he said, he said, there's Chinese there. I said, no, they're not Chinese. They look Japanese. And they walked towards us. There's two young guys. One about six feet tall, pretty good size for Japanese. And the other one about a couple inches smaller. He looked like he was a little younger. They were dressed like typical teenagers. And she, the gal that was with them, had the same white sweater, same denims. And she turned her back and folded her arms. And that's how she stood. I knew her body language and everything. I saw her standing away from me where I couldn't see her face. The two young guys come up to us on the porch, about 10 feet away from us. And he asked me, the taller one asked me, he says, where is the new Walmart? And I said, that's just right over the Silver Pass, about a quarter of a mile. And he goes, uh, okay. After that, my cousin and I both were turned off. We could not talk. We All we did was just sat there and looked gawked. 
he couldn't talk. He's usually he's actually talked so much he gets rude, my cousin. And you know, he would he would have just really nailed him or just really ask him all kinds of questions. But he was looking down at the ground, his eyes were all glassy. He could not talk. I couldn't talk. I wanted to, I tried to ask him, I tried, I moved my lips to try to say, is that Hiroko over there? You know, I tried, tried, and he knew what I was trying to ask. They were reading my mind. Apparently, he went inside my house. The door was right beside my right arm, went inside my house, picked up a little portfolio, a pleather uh, folio that I just, but I do use it for notes and, you know, protect it from rain and stuff. So he got that out. He looked in it and he looked at me, kind of gave me a dirty look. And he had those sharp eyes, just like his mother. And uh, he looked at me and he got something out and he's looking. And apparently he took all the notes that I had on Hiroko out of that out of that uh, portfolio, but he was, I fooled him. I, I already typed out the notes and I had all the notes ready, to, you know, to roll. So I, I had, that's why I had them in my book and I had them all, you know, but he took the handwritten copy. He thought that's all I might've had, but no, I don't, I do things differently. I always make a typed hard copy of the notes and put them in a ledger. Uh, but I didn't see him go in and out twice. Then they walked away. And then I started coming too when they hit the road about oh, 75, 80 feet away from me. And I started coming. My cousin wasn't, he didn't come too yet. And he, they walked towards her and I was watching him walk towards her. And then he finally come too. And he said, where are they at? I said, right there. He says, he said, I didn't see him. And he said, did you see him? I said, yeah. When they, when they hit the road, I saw him walking towards Hiroko. He said, who the hell is Hiroko? <laughs> I said, that's the alien I ran into at Sedona. That's her. And he looks and he says, he says, wow. So this is crazy. And then they got to the stop sign and I said, let's quit talking. Let's just watch. So we watched and what happened was they just disappeared and we didn't see him go up. We can see, we had a good line of sight up and down the road. They did not travel out in a car. They were not picked up. They were picked up by some, uh, some, uh, UFO craft is what happened. My cousin blew it. Then he got up and he said, he, he was cussing. He said, F this, F that. He said, Dave, there are those ETs are going to kill you one of these days. He said, you better quit effing with them. You know, I said, I said, cuz I said, it's okay. They didn't hurt you. And he says he was, he turned white and he was just really, I had experiences and he didn't. That was his first experience. So it kind of shocked you pretty bad on your first one. So he walks to his truck and he looks back at me, he says, you're crazy, man. He said, you deal with these, these people, these ETs. He said, you're going to be dead. And he said, I'm serious. He said, I'm getting the hell out of here. So he got in his truck and took off. The next day, his wife asked me, he said, what'd you do to him? I said, I didn't do nothing to him. I said, my visitors did. I said, they knocked us out. They dumbed us down. She said, what does that mean? I said, that means we don't realize anything. We don't know anything. All we can do is watch and observe. And he said, oh, okay. Uh, but that, as a matter of fact, last week we had lunch together. My older brother usually pokes at him. He says, you had that ET event. Have you ever forgotten it? He's, he sits there and lowers his head and he looks at him. He goes, no, I haven't. He said, that's the strangest thing I've ever had in my life. And I looked at him. I said, well, you just went through an ET experience. And he said, I don't want that ever happen again. He said, that was scary, really scary. So, so it's still fresh in our memories. And that was the big story. That was where the other shoe dropped. And I thought, she's real. The red flags were there from the first visit to Sedona. But when she come to my house with the two young guys and I ran into a, uh, she was kind of a uh, spiritual leader. And I ran into her at a UFO conference in Arkansas. I went there all the time with my friends and we'd go there and watch, you know, I even had friends that were speakers there and stuff. So, uh, but I went downstairs where they had these little booths and stuff. They were selling uh, ornaments. And I walked past this gal and she was some kind of, she deals with uh, porpoises or something in Florida. She has something and she, she is, is a reader. And she says, I told her, no, I don't want to read. I said, I don't need a, a reading. She said, no, I'm not charging. I don't want to do a reading. She said, I've already read you. I said, what, what do you mean? She said, you had an ET event just recently. I said, yes, I did. And she said, I can tell you, I said, I'll tell you about it. And she goes, no, I'll tell you about it. Thanks. That's what she told me. And, and I, and she said, you had a, a, a young lady, Asian, she said, and she said her bone structure, cheeks and chin was just like yours. 
And I said, wow. So how do you know that? She said, I just know these things. She said, I, I read your energy. And I said, who is she? And she looks at me. She said, you don't know. I said, no. She said, she's your daughter. I said, that kind of hit me because I had that thought in my mind. Uh, and these two younger Japanese young guys had the same bone structure, kind of different bone structure than the round face of a Japanese. And uh, I thought I'm, I could be part of their, their DNA. And I've had some uh, some hosts ask me directly, are those your kids? Could you answer that now? I, I sat and thought, I don't have, I'm just kind of play acting now, but I'd sat and thought for a little bit. I said, yes, they are. I, I really feel that they were, yes. Because of the things that happened to me in my groin area preceding years. And then the one big abduction I had, uh, had several abductions that, that involved electricity, a shock. Uh, and I talked to Dr. David Jacobs about that in, in Arkansas. He, uh, uh, he told me about what was going on. And I said, I, I was laying there resting my back. It was daylight. I could see the sun through my bedroom door. And I was just laying there stretching my back. And I had my left hand up against the headboard and, and laying just stretching out. And, but something told me, you'll get, you'll get a warning ahead of time. What they do is they wear you down with energy, you get tired and then you'll go to bed and then you'll probably go to sleep. But I didn't go to sleep. I was awake, I was conscious. And I felt, I heard this noise in behind me. It was just a loud, like taking three big boxes of crackers and just stomping them, making all kinds of noise, static electricity is what it was. It hit me in the shoulder and I, I kind of straightened out. And then I tried to move my shoulder, try to see who it was behind me. And then they hit me again. And then I couldn't move, I was paralyzed. And then my sister was yelling at me from down the hallway. And she said, come on, Dave, you can do this. You can do it. Come on. I said, do what, sissy? That's what I called her. She said, she said, you can do it. I said, come to the door where I can see you. She said, I can't. I can't. And it was her voice. I knew her voice very well. But the biggest thing to that is she was dead four years before that experience. Damn. So she was talking to me through dimensional portals in which the ETs opened up and then she was able to uh, communicate with me. I laid a little bit longer in my hand. I felt a baby's hand put in my hand and my fingers. I could move the tips of my fingers. I grabbed the palm of the hand and the fingers and it was a baby's hand and it was a young, I mean, infant's hand. And I thought that's human. You know, they had five fingers and a, and a little soft palm. I said, my God, what does this all mean? You know, and then something sat down beside me that was heavy on the bed up against my hip. I, I just took a deep breath. I said, what is going to happen next? You know, so I, I couldn't, I, that was it. I just kind of blew it. I said, I yelled out, God help me uh, real loud. And uh, everything kind of disappeared. Well, when I did my book and it's really good that I get my ledger out and my notes, I can figure out dates. And it was precisely nine months later from October that the baby's hand was put in my hand. So it had to do something with Hiroko. Damn. So do you think that she went and, I guess, got impregnated and then nine months later had that human baby and then brought it back to, brought, yeah, the baby back for you to see it? Not to see it, but just to feel the yeah, hand. Yeah. All I, that's all I felt. But it told me, they, they, they give you messages that it's hard to figure out. Sometimes it takes you a little bit to figure out because they, they, they relate to us in a different manner than what we're used to, but they give you a physical message. You have to interpret that. And I, and I did when I saw the nine months later, but I had a regressed dream about being in that room. Like I was telling you, they, they took this hose to my groin area. I kicked away and then they, and then they knocked me out and I was out. Then the dream went, they got me out of the bed. One held one arm, my left arm. The other one had a bright light, it was this tubular light, you know, this round. It looked like a fluorescent tube, but it was really bright. And as I was walking, they would shine that light in, in my eyes and across my forehead. And I thought, what's going on? I couldn't see it hurt my eyes. And I saw two silhouettes of people sitting at the little table that the you know rooms have. And I saw two silhouettes there. And I saw the door, the patio door that went to my room. And they were walking me back and forth. And I was wondering, why did they walk me back and forth? It took me, I was a little slow 
took me several months to figure this out, Brandon. They walk you because that makes you open your eyes when you're walking. If you were laying down, your eyes would be closed and you wouldn't have to open them and they'd have a harder time getting that light signal into your brain. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That checks out. Uh, that's good thinking. I went back and I took pictures of the room and I asked the manager, I had the same room the next following year. And I did, I took pictures of it and I looked at the pictures. Like I said, I try to draw these things out to try to get some facts and proof for me to know. And I looked at the pictures. I said, Oh my God, that's exactly right. That's the path that I was walking towards the patio doors and back. And there was the table sitting right there where I saw it in the regress dream. So that was a lucid regress dream. Why I was left with that, I think they were amateurs. That's why I think they didn't get me totally. Or I have a higher consciousness level than what they're used to dealing with. I can, I can pull these things back. I've had a lot of lucid dreams. Uh, and and they, if I find one fact in the dream, then the dream is real. And most of the time, the lucid dream facts are, are, are real that I have because I can pull one factor out from it saying, yes, that's true. Yeah. So I've been I had that electrical abduction a couple of times after that. Uh, the first one, actually, I lay in there and it hit my I wasn't asleep yet about 1030 at night and I had a cold. I felt like I had bronchitis. I could have pneumonia. I was going to go to the doctor the next morning and I was laying there and something hit my finger like it almost blew it off. This was before this big event I just told you. That was the largest event that I had, and but it almost blew my finger off and there's electricity. I wasn't around any electricity. My hand was way away. But the next morning I went, it was kind of like a healing shock. I didn't have, the doctor took even took x-rays and stuff, said, no, you have a little bit of cold or something, but uh, you don't have pneumonia or anything. And I said, wow. I said, I couldn't breathe last night. She said, that's weird. She said, you're doing fine now. I said, yeah, but I didn't tell her anything about that electric, electrical shock that I got that could have been a healing shock. And that's why I say that they're not here to hurt us. You know, I'm wondering if people are now going to have to go into their doctors after these sort of ET, you know, visits or contact experiences and kind of explain, hey, I, I probably got shocked. I, you know, that could have to do with why, you know, my appetite's a little fried right now. That may be part of you disclosing part of your medical information is some kind of contact history or abduction experience. Well, my doctor looked at me. Uh, she was one of the a fine doctor, best doctor I've ever had. She was very sharp. Uh, I would tell her some of these things and she'd look at me. She said, I, I didn't want to say ETs, but I told her I was, you know, on radio and I told her I was writing a book and she says, wow. She says, and you're, you're an older veteran and you're doing all this. I said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a little, I'm a late starter. I told her <laughs> so, uh, plenty of time. Yeah. And I said, these are the bucket list. She said, she said, you're different than the rest of the uh, veterans. And she said, you know, she pointed at my head. I said, well, I try to keep it sharp and going. And she and she looks at me kind of unusual. But I approached her. Here's something. Maybe you're going to run out of time and I'll, I'll get this this last one out in which has been lately. OK. Since 2016. Except it was uh, August 12th on the first event. 2016. I got the list here. I can just read them off instead of instead of guessing at the dates. I got them written down here because this is very weird and and the most scariest thing that I'm going through right now, Brandon. Very scary for me. It was August 13, 2016. I was frozen. Three o'clock in the morning. I woke up. My arms were crossed. I was laying on my back. I never lay like that. I felt my arms and they were just frozen, just like I took them out of a freezer. My whole body was frozen. The whole bed was shaking because I was just shaking from, from being so cold. My wife did not wake up. She would wake up if my cell phone dropped off the nightstand and hit the carpet. She would wake up, but she did not wake up with the whole bed shaking and making noise. And I felt it. And I said, oh, my God. So I got out of bed and I thought I was dead. But I, I, my mind was turned off for some reason. Something just controlled my mind. I went in and took a leak. When you get cold, you have to go take a leak a lot of times. So I went and took a leak, and I was shaking on the, on the toilet. I didn't want to stand up. I had to sit down because I was just vibrating everywhere. And I went back to bed, threw the blankets back on, and I was so exhausted that I went out. 
I passed out. I told the wife about it the next day and I wrote it in my ledger. And then it happened again, 2017, August 16th, just two days or so apart. And, uh, and that same event, same thing happened. I got up to pee and I was frozen. I thought I was dead. Just, I can repeat that cycle six times, but I, for, for time being, I'm just, and then in 2018, they kind of missed it. They come back in January 24th. And that was the only time that was kind of a little bit off kilter because in 2020, they were in my house. Uh, so that, that, that 2018, they come in January 24th, 2019, I had a freezing episode. Then August 2019, I had another one that same year. I had two August 10th, right around the same date in August. And then September 2nd in 2021, uh, I had the same freezing event just last September. And in 2020, I didn't have one. Weird. They were in my house. I got pictures of them being in my house. I had a reptilian, I had a Michelin man, and I had a bright entity that come in my house. I got it on my trail cam and uh, they set off my alarms and everything. So I knew who they were. I knew what they were doing. Okay. I, I talked to three doctors about this freezing episode. The real good doctor, she looked at the, the trainee doctor and then she looked at me and she goes, she checked my blood on the, on the computer, my blood test and everything. I don't have sugar diabetes or any, no blood disorder. And then she says, I don't know what to tell you. She says, I can't answer that. She said, there's, I don't have an answer for that. She said, your body is your body. Health is not telling me that that would happen. And so one doctor told me that I went to, she said, well, when you go through this, take your temperature. I said, wise idea. But I said, when I'm going through this, my mind is completely off. I don't think. All I do is go to the bathroom. I come back. I go to bed. It's done. I don't. I do not think. I don't even think to wake up the wife. I don't even think. And I usually would. I'd say, honey, feel my arms. I'm frozen. You know. I said, I don't know what's going on, but I don't. It's I'm turned off. Something's controlling me. And then when I told the doctor the dates, most of them were in August and September. Same every year. That they couldn't answer. Then they thought, okay, this guy has got some weird stuff going on. You know, so that's what they're saying in their heads. So, yeah, most doctors aren't into the ETs, UFOs, but I found some that are. I had one doctor who kept me a half an hour longer in the exam room just so as I can tell him some of the things that happened to me. He said, oh, could you give me that stuff in writing? He said, that's great. He said, I love that stuff. Some doctors do. And but some doctors won't say anything because they're afraid of their professional credentials being damaged. So that's what I'm concerned about. What's going to happen this August? Uh, I don't know. Could that be my last one? I don't know what's going on. I talked to another scientist just the other night. Very smart guy. I, I can't mention his name or anything. We talked a lot of stuff that's kind of secretive. And I keep some of this stuff, you know, from being out. But he told me. I asked him, I said, do you think that they're taking my energy, my consciousness and my soul and taking it to another dimension? And he was trying to think because he's he's medical, too, but he was kind of thinking of a medical terminology, but he couldn't. And he told me, he said, that's very possible. You could be transported to another dimension and your body is left cold without your energy, your soul. They make an avatar of you, a hologram. And I've had a double made of me. And he told me, he said, oh, yeah, doubles are made. I, I'm talking to a person now who said that they're cloned. <laughs> so so I, I meet interesting people because when you're out there doing this and, and when, when they know you're one of them, they open up to you. you know? So I, I'm happy about that. But I do have to keep a certain amount of secrecy you know, to these people. So. All right. Well, you keep your secrets and that's fine. But uh, Dave Emmons, thank you so much, man. We're probably going to wrap it here, but your book and all the ways to find you are absolutely going to be located down in the show notes. We have a lot more to talk about. So we'll probably talk about this the next time that you come on, man. And we'll definitely have you back. This is incredible, brother. I really appreciate you, man. This is amazing. Maybe by the time I'm back, I might have more information about secretive things, but people have to believe the thing we need to do is quit fighting one another. That's what 
the government wants us to do is to turn on each other. I listen to all experiencers. I don't call them liars or doubt them. I've been treated like crap by a couple of hosts and I didn't like it because then they, they always say, then you can't prove it. I said, I got witnesses, neighborhood witnesses, everything. You can't prove it. And I knew this guy was just out to, to give me, you know, crap. So we can't do that to each other. Well, I mean, uh, that's not what we do here. I've, I've got no mission to prove myself right or you wrong or anything. I want to hear your story. And you have a lot of compelling things that I was noting along the way, especially your abduction phenomena and experience phenomena that actually uh, are very interesting. And I, I want to go into further with you in the future. I just wanted everybody to hear your story on this and absolutely uh, point to your book here. So there's a lot of uh, contributing details to this. And I don't need you to prove any of it. I think it's fascinating either way. And this was awesome. You're a great dude. And I had a blast talking to you. You too. You've been a, a gracious host and I really like it. I mean, just a good, good show. You got a good, good darn show. Fascinating guy. Such a sweetheart, Dave. Dude, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, those are fascinating stories. And of course, all the ways, guys, to check him out. They, what they want, his book, all the other stuff are going to be linked down in the show notes. Check that thing out, Bo Show. Great dude, Dave. Thanks again, man. Also, down in the show notes is going to be our affiliate links. So, Food Forest Abundance, check that thing out. Libsyn, if you want to start your own podcast, if you're going to buy anything at all through Amazon, run it through our link. It helps the show. Please and thank you. Opus, the organization for paranormal understanding and support. Check that thing out. They are a phenomenal resource for folks exactly like Dave and his story. So, if you related to any of this, check the link. Or if you know somebody who did, check the link. It's Lester Velez's jam. He is amazing. He will take great care of you. So also, if you guys would like to expand your experience with us here on the show, do that at expandingrealitypodcast.com. That's going to be links to everything. You can uh, help the show and support over there with our expansive insider, and we give you some bonus stuff. And then also all the videos from YouTube that are way too cool, they get played there. So they're, they're free as well. The lives get replayed there. Just go sign up. Uh, it's very easy, and we do not spam you. Uh, you can just go check it out. So it's going to be a good hub and a resource for you all uh, to get Okay, so go out into this beautiful place, guys, whatever the hell this thing is. Keep your eyes peeled for some amazingness going on. It's happening all the time, so look for it. It's there. Then look around for some litter and get that shit up off the street because we don't want that. Also, uh, buy somebody in line around you a coffee or a meal. Something small goes a massive, massive way as far as the ripple effect in the collective goes. As well as if you are in the left-hand lane and you've got somebody behind you wanting to pass, just scoot on over. Just scoot on over to the right. And then they'll be by and then you can keep living your lives. Get out of the left-hand lane. Above all and anything else, guys, go out into this beautiful place, whatever the hell it is. And y'all just be good to one another. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you next time.